Bonjour à tous. Euh, je, je, nous avons le privilège aujourd'hui de vous accueillir uh, au sein du, du musée de Cluny, le musée Cluny national Museum, the, du Moyen Âge, the National Museum of the Middle Ages, in a wonderful setting. We are in this, the room of sculpture of Notre Dame de Paris. I'm Marie Laure. I'm a gemologist and an art historian. I'm a research professor at the Art School of Jewelry Arts. And we're getting into the subject of Journey into Crystal. The school was created in 2012 with the objective of helping the public to discover the whole area, which is quite secret, in fact, of uh, jewelry. The school is not a school in the academic point of view, but it's really a, a, a place of sharing and having activities, and there are conferences and workshops, uh, exhibitions and publications. And the main topics we deal with are knowledge in the world of gems and jewelry. With me today, we have Isabelle bardes Fronti. I'm so happy. Hello, Marilo. So happy to do this now, Isabel is a curator of heritage at the um, Museum of Cluny since 20, 2007. You are in charge of antique uh, alto medieval uh, collections and Islamic collections, and you're also uh, teaching at the School of the Louvre. You're in charge uh, of, of the competition to become a curator at the Louvre School. You are commissioner for roughly 15 exhibitions with the catalogs that went along with that. And this year, a big challenge because you have put together two exhibitions, one on Le Tangier in Draguignan in France, which is over, unfortunately, but which was extremely successful. And this exhibition, which you put together with Stefan Pennek, A Journey into Crystal at the Cluny Museum in Paris. Thank you for that introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here in the Cluny Museum in the journey into crystal. Marilo indicated that I'm not the only curator. I received the help and the work with uh, Stefan Penek, who's an archaeologist and a, a art restorer. He's also chair of a company. So we are here in the School of Jewelry Arts in Cluny, and we have uh, they have this, we're in, around us are the sculptures from the, the Notre Dame Église. So this is a, a setting, an architectural setting that is divided into, there's an antique part and a medieval part. That part was uh, built at the end of the Middle Ages. Next year, it'll be 120 years old because it was in March 2024. It'll be the 120 years from the opening around the original collection, which is, uh, the collection of Alexandre de Soma, and it's his son Edmund who uh, had the honor of opening and directing the museum for the first 40 years. So let's start with this wonderful title, Journey into Crystal. In guise of introduction, we uh, suggest we have a look at this video with some beautiful pictures that was produced by Valentin Fejouz and Florent Molle. I'm going to read a few excerpts from Journey into Crystal, the novel by Georges Sand, which inspired the, the title of this exhibition. I have the eye fixed on the quartz sky, the, the rock crystal, where Laura stopped for a moment with a certain amount of pleasure. Suddenly, I felt a light hand uh, posed on my shoulder, and a, and a delicious voice of Laura spoke to me in my ear. Quickly, quickly, we're he heading to the journey of crystal. I'm coming. Follow me if you love me. Look where I'm bringing you, she said, and recognize that I've opened your eyes to the light of the sky. My dear Laura, he said, I'm starting to understand, but look up there far from away and all around the horizon which closes us in, icy, icy, icy summits and ice. Oh, my Laura, you be blessed for having brought me here. Where did you learn the live? What does it matter where I learned it? Just look at it and savor the beauty of the crystal around you. This novel by George Sand uh, it was extremely expiring. So Laura, 
Journey into Crystal was published by George Sante in um, 1859. And it guided us, actually, Stefan Pinnick and, my, and me, in the design of the project, including for the, the, the scenography, because sometimes it's small and sometimes it's big in relation to Crystal. It's a wonderful world. And it's one of the uh, advent of one of the, it was bought by Edmond de Saumon. It was a famous tatry, uh, a tapestry of the woman with a unicorn. And it was signed by Prosper Améry, who's going to be giving money for the historic monument to Edward de, Edmond de Saumon. And that was done in 19, 1883. So it's a very unusual story for us. So we have, uh, uh, so this is another reason to choose this title, and we're extremely appreciative of the two curators. It's a very inspiring text. So we'd like to invite you to this journey into crystal in three uh, uh, times. We're going to discover, first of all, what crystal is and what uh, was invented, what knowledge is around this uh, art. And Isabel is going to be discovering uh, the imaginary side of crystal, and we're going to be finishing by discovering in the actual exhibition with Isabel, who's going to show you some crystalline uh, uh, jewelry, which are extremely representative of, uh, of this type of creation uh, using crystal. Let's start with the material. So what is crystal? Well, let's start by what we used to believe about crystal before, we, before the first crystallography, Jean-Baptiste uh, Romet. I think we can call him the head of crystallography, before he gave the physical definition, a mixture of silicious uh, uh, and uh, oxygen. But they thought initially it was frozen water. Straubon is the author in his geography which is the oldest thing we a reference we have where they speak about crystal. Was he the first to cite it as, uh, as iced? No, because in Crystallus in Greek, there's a, a drastic section, a selection. We've lost the antique text, but today we can say that the, the first text that we have knowledge of was Strabo. Um, he's a, a Greek geograph geographer, who, uh, and he finished when he was uh, 25 to 26 before our century. In antiquity, we had Pliny the Elder, who developed these ideas in his natural history in the Second Career. An extract, extract, it was a, a, a insatiable curiosity. He died of his curiosity in 79, and he received a command by the emperor to, uh, to write a, a document which is extremely precious to us because it was the first printed version of natural history. It was the first encyclopedia. And there were 37 books, and the 27th was devoted to uh, rocks and stones. It was so important. It was the, the mother of gems, which is the first mineral he speaks about, crystal. And in the ninth paragraph, he enters into a discussion of these minerals, which in, including rock crystal. And he goes back to this notion to the end of the, which is pre predominant at the other encyclopedia, which is extraordinary. It's kind of an echo by Pliny in the Middle Ages, which you see in Bartholomew the English, who in his book says, also talks about uh, crystal is a shiny uh, rock, which says the color of water because it's gendered by stone and hardened over long, much time. So the idea of crystal being uh, from ice was uh, continued for, for, for several centuries. On the screen, you have a, a version translated by Jean Cobachon translated from this uh, encyclopedia. And in the exhibition, we are fortunate to have three copies of that translation illuminated in the 15th century, as you can see here. 
in different periods of the 15th century, particularly well known. You can see this in almost all books on stones. Thanks so much for the French Bibliothèque Nationale because we could show you three different types of, of, of graphics. There's one in the water. There's some noble people who are picking up precious stones uh, from the river edge. And other people around a presentation of cabochons, of, uh, of sculpted tabochons, because this is kind of an echo, a spectacular echo, with the, what we're going to be seeing here. And the one who's speaking about the mother of gems is Jean de Mondeville in the 14th century, who uh, he calls Crystal the mother of all gems. Today, they have the scientific spirit, which we have, is explained differently, but in the Middle Ages, there was no, uh, nature was not separate from, uh, they considered uh, gems as living things. It could be male or female that are born, they grow, and they die. And very often, it's the color that indicates the, site, the, the sex of the green. And the light colors are, are female, and the darker colors are male. And we, by analogy, consider quartz to be favorable uh, for women who are nursing their children. So from crystal to quartz. Now the term of quartz, the word crystal or crystallos, it dominates up until the, uh, the arrival of science in the 18th century. But there's the word quartz, which is then going to be uh, continuing, and uh, which is, appears first in the 16th century. The, it's a German name that you find in the work of George Agricola, having, with respect to a gem that one finds in Sax mines in Germany, Saxony. But that's, that's, that, so that, because there is, is a mixture of crystal, of silicon, silicium, silex, and uh, other things in the same text. So it's in this 18th century that crystal will be start to being called quartz. And since Pliny was a, it was a, a love the geometrical beauty, you can see the presentation a monocrystal of Druze and Geodes in the story of gems. The first that would use quartz to observe the crystallography was Jean Baptiste Rome de Lille, who worked on, it became a generic term for everything that is corpus angulatum, and crystal became quartz. So, so the arrival of chemistry of chemists in crystallography that could identify this uh, the mineral species more precisely. Johann Heydrich Put, who's a, a German chemist, followed by a Swedish person called Mr. Bergman, came to the conclusion that quartz, crystal, flint, and sand were similar in chemical composition. So for new, quartz is a mineral. It's a mineral species which is part of uh, silicium. Uh, it had the same composition, uh, chemical composition, ICO2. And we have quartz uh, and natural glass and opal. They're not minerals because their atomic structure is not organized. Quartz is a mineral and in nature we'll find this in two forms, monocrystalline and polycrystalline. Monocrystalline quartz is big crystals, and polycrystalline uh, is microcrystals, microscopic crystals that are aggregated together. And so the monocrystalline and polycrystalline form are linked to the, depend on the temperature during the formation process. And these rock crystal or quartz are colorless uh, versions as to the physical properties or wonderful properties it's transparent to opaque it's extremely hard it's it's robust it resists breakage 
and stable under temperature changes. And it has also particularly interesting optical uh, characteristics. In, in, in so it can actually enlarge. It can be convex or concave. With respect to this uh, atomic structure, and this part is very, what is a crystal and what is a mineral? Now, to understand the difference, the quartz is silicium, which is crystallized and systematically organized and regularly in space. And the glass, as you can see, the structure is not at all organized. There's no crystalline system, and it's amorphous. So there's a question of organization of the atoms, and this organization has a consequence on the pro properties, the physical properties of that material. So crystal, what we call crystal today, is not at all a mineral. It's, it's not an organized structure, so it's an abuse of language. Uh, crystal is glass with lead, which uh, was developed in the 17th century, and it's mainly developed in the 18th century. We have an example, a very interesting example here from an artist who worked a lot on this material. You just showed us the, the previous structures, the difference between mineral and what isn't mineral, a manufactured product of which we call glass. And there was in 1627, if I, Stefan Falango, for industrial reasons, uh, which it crystallized to the end of the 17th century, especially in Bohème. And that's where you, there were the first trials because we realized that it was transluid and shiny, similar to rock crystals. So, so from an economic point of view, it was interesting because you could have uh, uh, things that were less sumptuous than rock, rock crystal uh, articles. So it, they could be replaced in this way. So the people from BAM came to the east of France. And in 1775, they performed uh, built a, a crystal production unit near Meisenthal, and that's where Patrick Neue, to get back to the image you have uh, in front of you, Patrick Neue is an artist who was nourished in, in his childhood by the presence of crystal. He developed a, a very early a fascination for that transcendent dimension of the transparency of crystal uh, and lead uh, crystal, but for the same optical effects. He also joined by that his, uh, he, 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 he developed a real taste for the Middle Ages and rock crystal uh, and was extremely interested in medieval art. And for that reason, Stefan Penick and myself thought of him because we wanted in our exhibition to have a, a contemporary um, presence as well. So that way we can cover the, the, early, the early days through the Middle Ages up until now. But it's not a rock crystal. And he, he knew this. So we selected uh, from lead crystal objects that he's created a spiritual assonance with the subject of this uh, uh, exhibition. You can see on the left image a fascinating work which shows the way he works glass in smoke. He puts a, a candle in the glass and then he draws on that smoke a, a, a work of art. And here we have a battle of, of um, Paolo Uccello and pride of having, of having the possibility to come to this museum. museum. He was happy to be in, in, in contact with Giacomo, Giacometti, but he understood the Crystal Doge, and that's why we can now focus on a very contemporary creation. This was one, finished just one month ago. And he started uh, in the Marché de Sainte Marie aux Mines, which is a very big market near Saint Martin Lorraine. And he engraved on this quartz three skeletons, which form a danse macabre, uh, and echoing one of the Roman works that he likes the most, that is in Auvergne. Uh, so let's join these two materials together. And so visitors could understand that they're different, but if there is this abuse in language, it is for a good reason. 
because it's very uh, similar in the visual effects that are revealed. All of the minerals are crystals, but not all crystals are minerals. Because when it's synthetic, you can't qualify it as mineral. And quartz is a synthetic, which is extremely important today in industry. We, we've been manufacturing that since the beginning of the 20th century. That's when it was developed, and in particular, for the usage of the remarkable property of quartz, which is piezoelectrical effect, which is a property of some crystals to vibrate regularly when they are subject to electrical passage of electric current. So then that property is extremely important in, um, of, of quartz. So we, we manufacture uh, uh, a lot of tons of, uh, of this type of material every year now. Now, rock crystal, natural crystal. Let's see where we find it on the planet. Everywhere. You find it just about everywhere. You have a, great, a nice selection here, which is not exhaustive. You cited some locations where they, we can find it. But that's what's fascinating about the crystal, the Roche crystal. It's recognized universally for its transcendence and universally uh, praised for its precious nature, but not as precious as diamonds because it's found just about on every continent in the world. So in this exhibit, we have a, 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 a variety of crystals. In another place, which you can see on the map, that's Pakistan. And you also indicated Madagascar is an important source. Just a few words to say that in Mayotte, there's an archeological site of great interest. And it was a, a trading area for quartz at the time, and which by road it, it could reach, and by the Nile, it could go up to the Egyptian uh, areas. And archaeological uh, uh, digs in Pradi and uh, in the Aga Khan Foundation. And our friends from Lifpo and Alexandria looked in the theater of Alexandria and they had found actual workshops of granite and quartz uh, attesting to the lapidary uh, uh, activities in the period of the arrival of, uh, around the arrival of Islam into Egypt. How interesting. There's a lot of international commerce which very early on were dealing in this material which was considered to be extremely precious material. A few examples of the know-how in a uh, rock crystal. This means en en engraver. That's where the word comes from. Now, this is an art which is very complex. You have the hardness of the quartz mineral. For the piece in the middle, which is a bucket, you have to have a huge block. And this is a monolithic block. It's a single block. So you're basically removing material. And you obtain, for example, for the Roman work on the right here, you have a, round, a rounded uh, sculpture. It's a miniature. One of the most appreciated objects in this exhibition. It's a, really a work of art uh, uh, from Bilegate in Malibu. On the left-hand side, you have another technique which is uh, engraving, engraving on the back side. So, so this is a, a, the, a, a, a reproduction of an, a work of Michelangelo that's conserved in the British Museum. And it was engra engraved backwards, a technique from the Renaissance and an intermediate effect. And then the center, and it's something very extraordinary, which belonged to Louis XIV and uh, in the 14th, maybe beginning of 15th centuries. And there was, they used to like to sculpt in this method in Paris. And he ordered Jean-Baptiste Jean de Metalim, an artist who was extremely, uh, had a, a great fortune. He ordered a small engraving which naturally uh, fit 
uh, it was a, just a, a slight accident. There can be inclusions or defects, and sometimes, but so this is kind of a, a, an artistic restoration. But there are others in, in the exhibition, even more in the museum, in the Louvre Museum, to show how much the the kings of France loved um, crystal uh, rock crystal, in, including Louis XIV. Yes. In fact, they, they're um, dissimulating um, inclusions. Let's start with the the, the, Co the Cologne uh, workshop. This was discovered during an archaeological dig. Yes, we talked about Alexandria, but if we look at the, the, the uh, chronological approach to the Middle Age, and that the first thing that appears is Venice. It's another important source. This is not exhaustive, but in the Middle Ages, there, Venice was very important. In terms of Cullen, there were a lot of uh, pieces in rock crystal in the churches in Cologne and in the main cities around that area, in, in uh, reliquaries and churches, are very extra extravagant in terms of the size and the regularity of the cabuchon. So, so, but this wasn't a proof. Now, the proof was given in 2006 when, when they dug a, a parking lot, which was a real heritage site. And down at the end of the parking lot, at six square meters, they discovered thousands of small fragments that an artisan had left before he had left. So there was a, a, a nice uh, chronological uh, deposits. So the proof was uh, given. It's so beautiful because when the archaeologists found a vase that belonged to Phileas with ivory, it was it was it, it is a very important uh, discovery, which confirmed some uh, insertions of Theophile on the way you worked on crystal. And you have a, an example of a cabochon, which may be detailed in this. Yes, there were specialists in the Cabochon approach to hiding defects in the crystal. Now, in near Bonn, it's kind of a magnifying glass. In Dille de Chaim, a, a city that's not far from Cologne, which is manufactured in Cologne, and the Cabochon, which are extraordinary, we, we have the relic, reliquary uh, cross and the crucifixion by Évêque Bombard. Paris was also an important center for crystal um, cutting. This dates back to the 14th century. It's been kept in the Louvre. These composites uh, dates from that time. We have information uh, uh, about the business of crystal, crystal engraver and rock uh, uh, engraver, which put together the various uh, professions in Paris under Louis the Ninth, this extraordinary vase, a monolithic uh, vase in a single block, is sculpted in a block. We're very happy to share that with commissioners of the exhibition uh, devoted to festive uh, uh, decoration, of te table de decoration. It was almost unique because it's a monolithic piece. It's interesting that the models before the Renaissance uh, imitate generally. In fact, everything is a story of, of years going by. They're imitating the precious metal um, tableware, metal or, 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 or and, and lead crystal uh, was to replace uh, rock crystal. In the Renaissance, another thing that was developed and remarkably in Milan for the, and, and, and after Prague it went to, uh, so there were a, a lot of work in, the, in Prague. There were two important artists, Véry Obeli on the right, which is close to Raphael, who was, who was uh, delivering in the little uh, flacon uh, beautiful uh, engravings, uh, providing some opacity to this uh, enameled band. And this flacon 
is part of the royal collection from the 17th century, 16th, 17th, 18th century, which is in several parts. The, the metal hides the joints. And the loop by the end is, you can actually pour out of the mouth. And, and it was a, a kind of a debonair way of, uh, there are birds and so forth. There's a lot of crystal animals in these luxurious uh, tableware. The, this collection was actually more valuable than any painting ever. Yes, it cost a fortune, and the jest was the continuity with antiquity, because Pliny, in the passages we spoke about, said that that uh, a, a, a woman ruined her husband financially because she kept buying crystal. It's the presence of rock crystal in the royal t um, table as part of the of this continuum. So let's talk about the crystal imaginarium, some of these aspects of that. So the association of crystal to a tableware and, and containers and cups or vases or, uh, originally were uh, uh, led to the breath, the belief that it was ice. And Pliny explains that w we used it only to drink cold things because it was made of ice. And that's the origin uh, of the use of, of uh, crystal. And here you have a few examples, uh, antique examples. And an example that was uh, uh, during Fatimid. A very big, uh, uh, it was on the silk, the silk Road between Occident and Orient. Many crystal objects were going back up uh, into Europe. This is particularly interesting because this was produced in, in Persia. Now, this is a, a, an engraved stone, which is an invocation f for rain. So the, the art of the Griptic, we, it could exacerbate magical properties of gems. And so this is engraved with an inscription that can be translated, as you can see on the screen. The idea uh, is to get it to rain in a desert area, a desertic area. And this practice is still takes place in these regions. And you can read the, the lines on the screen of, of the incantations. They all are engraved. Now, maybe you want to insist on the symbols here. It's true that if you think about Christianity, we have the impression that crystal is, is a Christ symbol. But in fact, it's present in all religions, and because but other religions is a symbol of purity and power, uh, the vehicle by rock crystal, and it's I think it's embraced by all spiritualities in the world. But in the in the Western Christian world, it's associated with Christ, and the Oriental world as well, because now we have the thing that's not in the exhibition. It's a beautiful representation of the Byzantine Christ as an echo for several poets. I'm thinking of Emmanuel Files, a poet who uh, compared water and the purity and Christ in a kind of reception of everything that we said about uh, uh, older writings. And now these are in the exhibition. There's a discoidal cross, which is extraordinary from the Isle de, de Chaim. It's a, a magnificent, which dates back to the 12th century, which by itself, you just imagine the, when it's lit from behind by a candle or something, it's, it's kind of almost di divinatory. And in the center, you have, uh, coming from the Paderborn Cathedral in Germany, there's a monstrance, which in the inside of which there's a kind of an orb in rock crystal as similar to the one uh, um, by Salvatore Mondi, which you can show later. Here it is. Um, so this is, corresponds to a sepulcher. So this assonance between the idea of Christ's tomb and the Monstrance 
and with the, uh, uh, surrounded by the gold bands. And, this, uh, and so this is a Christ which is almost re always represented uh, in crystal. And the Van Cleve uh, t uh, painting is also exceptional. You can see that here because there are inclusions. And it was important to have this type of crystal ball, but they're not the only crystal balls. I'm going to let you pr perhaps uh, present crystal balls before we go and see them in the exhibition. So here are a few examples of crystal balls, which uh, are from, from various times. There's one in particular that we're going to see in the Chidrik's tomb, which is the first Merovingian king. It's, it was only the son of him, uh, Clovis, who, who became a Christian. So it wasn't during the Christian era, uh, era actually. And so perhaps that is the representation of royal power and the and also the, the therapeutic function of crystal balls was highly prized crystal balls when you let the light of the sun go through the crystal ball that is what makes the best way of cauterizing wounds and then subsequently therapeutic properties of crystal notably uh, by its a cold effect uh, they say that the crystal cools which are used in medicine which is in the Bois de Bot, which recommends using a crystal ball to lower a fever. We also are aware of crystal as a, as a, as a, as a means of divining. So, for example, you have John Dee's rock crystal ball use that for uh, fortune telling. And we also find other crystal balls used for divination in the 20th century. It are also fascinated by crystal and crystal balls and they're really the model of the creation of uh, artistic perfection. So let's get back with um, Isabel in the actual exhibit to and we're going to start with the necklace from Tilo. So we are in the ex exhibition. It's a frigidarium. It's an old room, an extraordinary room, which is the first room the visitors enter into. And that's where the temporary exhibition is. And next to me, you have pearls. You have uh, beads in Crystal de Roche. And the, 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 amongst the oldest we've ever found today, because they date back to the 14th millennium. They're probably a, a magnificent color. Obviously, we only kept the pearls, but the, they put them together on an, on, for the exhibition. That's 3,500 BC, and this color has a, a brother. It, I think it's a bracelet because there were fewer pearls and, or fewer beads, and that's still kept by the museum at the Louvre. Now, for us, this is the older, the oldest uh, uh, rock crystal pearl, uh, beads. The form of the beads are look like seashells. In Mesopotamia, we obviously have seashell uh, jewelry, so they're trying to reproduce that type of jewelry using crystal which also give an idea, look a lot like drops of water. Now, all of the epochs use rock crystal for, for beads. Now, this is not as obvious because it's, it's kind of opaque, but if you look at the next necklace with a bracelet where, with fewer uh, uh, beads. Now, this was found in Egypt. It's a mixture of rock crystal, comanine, and chalcedron. There are some uh, beads are transparent, and when they are transparent in this way, we know that when you talk about rock crystal, rock crystal takes the color of, the, of your skin. So there's an important dimension there in the relationship between the transparency, which seems to incarnate skin, the flesh. And, and this other one is Mer Merovingian. It's a big, very big one. It was found in Chaudley, in Mertimoselle in France. And here the sculptor had seem to want to reproduce the form of a polyhedron. It could not be an accident. And it, so giving the, 
the comprehension of these regular facets, and you can see the physical components of the quartz. Now let's move on to some rings. Here we have a Roman uh, ring in transparent quartz, which is uh, ornated uh, of a small, with a small woman's head whose uh, her hair uh, makes us think that it's in second century. It could not be worn vertically. It would have to be worn, worn on the little on the small on little on the little finger and with the head towards the outside, otherwise it wouldn't have fit. So follow me over here for another type of ring. These are men's rings now. Because these are rings of the Pope. We have two next to each other. There's one that's very big. Now these were made to be worn on, on a glove. That belonged to Paul II and it's been kept in the Cluny Museum. And right next to it, we don't know if it's for a Pope, but it's but it's a bag from the, fa the Merovere uh, um, family. Another type of highly valued jewelry are brooches. And they, they were used to, to close capes. The virgin with a child or the are, are, are extremely rich people who use this to close their their uh, their coats. And this is an animal one just kept in the National Middle Age Museum where we are. And it's one of the most rare examples that has arrived to us. These were so precious in their manufacture. They were forgotten or, uh, for other uh, other jewels. Where is the quartz, you may be wondering. It is there. And the top of the curved area on the extreme outside is probably from a personal reliquary, but it's on a pink, it was on tink cloth, so it made it look like a, but it is quartz, and it's just um, colored by the, the, the fabric behind it. Here's another brooch. It must be quite a big one for a big coat. This is more recent. It has an extraordinary story because it was found on a Scottish island in Lugbury. And what's valuable about it is other than the, uh, you've got the, per, the beads and the big central crystal ball, uh, rock crystal. And you can't see the backside, but there is an inscription on the backside which said that it was worn by an uh, unusual corporation, which is unusual, uh, by tinkers, which are, uh, uh, and they were uh, providing these services as they went around. It opens up on the inside. It's extremely ostentatious, and it was probably a kind of a, uh, probably came from a reliquary. I think Marino is going to talk about measuring time. So let's go back to the room. Now, the use of Ross Crystal in Cabochon to draw attention to relics and protect them, to use the, the enlarging power to better see the relic. Now this property was also used in, uh, in watchmaking. Very often rock crystal is used in, in former times as an enlarging, uh, as an, a magnifying glass in front of the clock face, the watch face. So it's a question linked to its durability. It's a, uh, extremely durable and to, uh, to protect the mechanism. There's a symbolic dimension in, in using this type of crystal in timekeeping objects. And this one has a, a, an actual skull, which uh, sends back to vanity. It's a comment on vanity and, and with the time, the idea of time passing. Croc crystal. Of course, it's going to be used more independently of the symbol symbolism in the actual mechanism. And here you have the first quartz astron um, watch developed by Seiko, a Japanese company, at the end of the 60s. And we're going to start developing these mechanisms for watches at that point in time, thanks to the piezoelectric properties that was discovered by uh, the Curie brothers. 
but quartz has been used in many Nobel Prizes and many major discoveries right until the structure of uh, DNA because the crystalline structure inspired the, the scientists who defined the structure of DNA, in a, but in a very difficult and different way, uh, having to do with the physical properties of quartz, which are shown uh, in a watch that was a kind of a pioneer in 1969 we have a few models that were designed in the 80s in the exhibition, which contrast very strongly of the older watches, but which uh, um, explains the role of quartz in timekeeping. And to conclude this presentation, we will also like to work on the use of rock crystal in jewelry in the 20th century. Now, these are pieces that are not in the exhibition, but as Isabel indicated, if they're from, if we have some that are prehistory from prehistory that are by faces that were <laughs> sculpted in rock crystal in jewelry and we have these two pieces which date back to 1934 both of them and the rock crystal is used as a material in modern times in jewelry with this remarkable example by Susan Bell Perron she was fascinated by different materials. So her, she liked calcidoine and rock crystal. And she worked closely with Adrien Loire, a stone sculptor, who was able to respond to some very difficult technical challenges for her. And often, rock crystal was used partly in, 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 in gems and in, in, in jewelry. But this actually was sculpted in rock crystal with metal incrustations. Another example uh, where the fun joins the function according to the principles that were spoken about the Bauhaus in the beginning of the 20th century. This is a uh, clock, a table clock, particularly modern for the time, which is inspired on architecture, from architecture, with crystal, which is remarkably pure, almost optical quality, which was fashioned by Van Cleef and Arpels during the 30s, 1930s. The exhibition, Isabel, will be lasting until the 14th of January. Yes, 14th of January in the evening. We're kind of, it's, we're about halfway through the exhibition. So people do have time during the holidays to come and have a look and visit us if you want to take this journey into Crystal. Thank you, Marilor, and thank you, Isabel, for welcoming us in this wonderful place. So you are invited very warmly to come and see us and visit the exhibition. The next conference will be about emeralds in relationship to Dubai at the end of the month, the Garden of Elmer Emeralds. And that will be on Monday, December 11th, 12 p.m. Paris time. And we will be available to you to listen to any questions you may have. There are some questions that have come in. Will we be able to answer? There's a question about the crystal uh, skull, which we didn't show. We, show, we did show you the, 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 the clock. Uh, I think that we're talking about the Quai Branly one, the, the Jacques Chirac Museum because there are several, no, it's more about what's the imaginary aspect of, you know, Indiana Jones and that stuff. As you were saying, Marilor, the Mintamori, these are watches with skulls. There are also vanities. We showed one in the exhibition that comes from the, the, the Kings of France exhibition, which dates certainly back to the 16th century which is at the bottom of a cross, and it's a symbol of the skull of Adam in Golgotha, because the rice was considered to be a new Adam. And in the 19th century, relaying a Mexican tradition, which appeared, and I think that's the question, a certain number of skulls that were bought by big museums. There could be the British Museum as well, and the Cape Only Museum as well, the Jacques Chirac Museum. And, and it so happens that Stefan Pinek was the commissioner that discovered this. And the incredible, the, 
the, the, the merchant of these fake crystal skulls was right across from the Cluny Museum. We didn't get them, and they were right across the street. So it was so they sold these and said that they were Aztec, which fascinated all of the artists in the 30s, the Surrealist and Picasso, Giacometti. They all went to see this in the Place de Trocadero, the extraordinary a skull out of rock crystal, which is magnetic when you look at it. It inspired the pop culture in the 20th century and the episode, I think, in the adventures of Indiana Jones, or the fourth, I, about the crystal skull. Well, we found it not long ago, and it had been worked with tools that no longer existed, didn't exist in, before the 17th century, so they said that it came from Mexico. And in fact, that was they were fakes. But if you look at the site of the British Museum, it's really kind of right in front. It's, it appears on the site. It is such an important and emblematic piece, and it's fascinating. Very happy to be able to show that Parisian version of it in this exhibition. You were talking about know-how. What tools did artisans use in the uh, Middle Ages? Well, the the, the, hard, you know, the hardest thing was uh, to polish. Maybe granite, um, clay. At the end of polishing, was done with lead sheets, and we found actually a lead sheet in in, in Cologne. It was a little piece of uh, crystal that was polished. It was the only one he forgot. He left. You can use diamonds as well, which is harder. There's a whole r range of the, uh, and because the quartz is very hard, and there are lots of materials that are even harder. It has to be equal or hard or harder. Today you can have uh, lathes with uh, steel. That's, what, that's the way it's done in Germany. These are effects that give a much more colder aspect, which uh, um, typically Mr. Reeps, who I met in preparing this exhibition, and, and Daldestein, when Damon Horst uh, uh, prepared a certain number of his works, in, including a Medusa, which in rock crystal, it was worked on with mechanical tools such as the fake uh, crystal skull that we talked about before. It's faster and it works, but it's colder in the final look. You can also use laser tools. Absolutely, I forgot to mention that. A very different effect. Now, the utilization of crystal, of rock crystal, in the prehistoric era. Now, in the exhibition, you will discover a few pieces that were sculptured in rock crystal, which are dated to the Paleolithic era and Musterian era. So we don't know more about that. What we know is that there are objects. This is a laurel uh, leaf and a, a scraper, which are sp uh, sp splendid, which look like shapes you can have in silex, but it's much more difficult to work with silex. It's, it's quartz, but it's polycrystalline, which means it's harder, because when you hit it, you can, you can uh, d damage it very easily. But, uh, well, but with quartz, you can't get the perfect form. If you look uh, at the way people work on silex, if you have the right gesture, it can go quite quickly. Gilles Tolizo and Carol Fred that are in the catalog are prehistorian uh, experts, but for years, they've been working since Roche Crystal appears very early in the archaeology of the Paleolithic uh, periods, and you find them with Neanderthals. We're used to saying that uh, Neanderthals are, 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 are uneducated, but they were working with Crystal, crystal Roche. So they as well we're able to see in purity a transcendence, maybe divinatory, but in any case, we are the ones doing the interpreting um, now and not then. Well, these are only hypotheses. Another question. About the usage of rock crystal in the 20th century jewelry. You talked about that a little bit. In the exhibition, you didn't cite them, but I, I will. We have uh, a, a necklace from Jean Vendôme. 
Now he put together a kind of renewal of the usage of quartz because he was fascinated by all stones. But he liked working with uh, lutein quartz in the middle of the inclusions. He put, there was a, a, an iron oxide and there were little golden claws inside the, uh, the quartz. And you can show a, a necklace from the 70s or 80s, I think. I can't remember exactly. <laughs> which was part of a series at the end of his career from the 70s, 80s, which he loaned to us from a private collection, which is extremely eloquent. But obviously we can cite other major houses such as Van Cliff and Arpel. And quartz today is really much, very much uh, uh, fashionable in, 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 gold, uh, in gold settings. And there's Cartier as well who has used a rush crystal a lot, who engraved, matte, uh, shiny, and all jewelers in Art Deco used uh, that uh, at one time or another, uh, rock crystal. Belperon, Boivin, and other materials. And then David Webb in the US had later on, by Adolphe and Cartier. I think that we have reached the end of our presentation. I'd like to thank you so much for having shared this moment with us. And Isabel, thank you so much for, for being with us. Sorry, uh, sorry for the coughing. It's okay, with great pleasure. See you soon.